Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Francis, the author of Josephine Baker's Cinematic Prism. I am Associate Professor of Cinematic Arts and Associate Dean for Inclusive and Critical Publics in the School of Communication at the University of Miami. I'm very pleased to deliver this year's Rajiv Vaidya Memorial Lecture for the National Gallery of Art. I will actually be speaking about memory, specifically film history, and the concept of rememory and what is missing and needs to be reassembled in film history through the career of Josephine Baker. What is rememory? Why not simply say memory? Why not say remember? Memory is, of course, a noun. And so how do you redo a noun? How do you make a noun? And when does a noun become an action? Here is where we need to enter into the literary, the theoretical, and the imaginative world of African-American literature and creativity. The term rememory comes from Toni Morrison's essay, Rememory a brief reflection on her use of the past in her novels, specifically Beloved and Song of Solomon, but we can see her use of the past both individual and collective in the ways that she explores forgetting, recollection, and the contentious work of history throughout her novels. The Rememory essay appears in her 2019 collection, The Source of Regard, that also reprints an older piece called The Sight of Memory. There she reflects on the narratives of Frederick Douglass, Alaudu Equiano, and Mary Prince, among others, in order to theorize the ways that she uses memory in her creative process of creating fiction. The nature of my research, she writes, begins with something as ineffable and as flexible as a dimly recalled figure, the corner of a room, a voice. Memory is therefore the beginning. Artifacts and historical realities form the authenticity of the work around which or out of which she creates a narrative that allows for an entrance into the present and thus into the future. Memory, remembering, and admonitions to remember are prominent themes within African American arts and letters. I think of Zora Neale Hurston's charge, let no Negro celebrity lie in inconspicuous forgetfulness, she wrote. This was a proposal for what she called the Cemetery of the Illustrious Negro Dead, here in Florida, where their resting place would be surrounded by evergreens and palms and rhododendron year-round. The cemetery would also give life in the form of hosting writers' retreats. Arthur Schomburg, whose own personal collection of books would form the basis of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, wrote an important essay in 1925 that's highlighted by phrases such as, the American Negro must remake his past in order to make his future. History must restore what slavery took away. And so among the rising democratic millions, we find the Negro to become the most enthusiastic antiquarian of them all. Schomburg's essay appears in Alan Locke's New Negro Anthology, which by its title declares the presence of a new cultural formation apart from an implied older cultural identity. Throughout the collection, the articles explore this important theme of returning to the past in order to understand the present and move into the future. The anthology, especially the introductory essay, is about imagining an amalgamation of Black people from different parts of the United States and the world moving into the future together. And importantly, that there was both a push and a pull in this movement. Locke says of the tide of Negro migration that it's, that it's not to be fully explained by as a kind of flood started by the demands of industry, the pressure of poor crops, and social terrorism. These are commonly understood reasons 
for the movement commonly known as the Great Migration, uh, when between uh, roughly 1915 and into the 60s, six million African Americans moved around the country in a series of migrations. Locke is observing part of that initial huge wave of black migration into New York, specifically Harlem, but he's careful to highlight the push and the pull of movement to someplace better. He says, the wash and rush of this human tide on the beach line of the northern city centers is to be explained primarily in terms of a new vision of opportunity, of social and economic freedom, of a spirit to seize, even in the face of extortionate and heavy toll, a chance for the improvement of conditions, a chance for the improvement of conditions. He speaks of a deliberate flight to the modern. Bringing together diverse elements, the African, the West Indian, the American of the North and South, the peasant, the student, the businessman, the professional, the artist, poet, musician, adventurer, and worker, preacher and criminal, exploiter and social outcast, each group, he writes, has its own separate motives. And this is so key because he highlights the agency and self-determination of Black migration, as well as the prismatic multitudes within Blackness. Now, what do Alain Locke's philosophical observations of Blackness is and deliberate flight have to do with remembering? His work in the anthology, theorizing and documenting his observation, allows us a unique window into this moment. Through this lecture, I'm also doing the work of rememory by reminding us what we need to know, we're supposed to have known, and what we can now know differently about the work and the process and the ontology of Blackness as the foundation of thinking about the work of remembering Josephine Baker's screen work and its place in a changing and multitudinous global Black American film history. Morrison's rememory means to go back and rethink what you thought you knew. The word itself takes on new life in this form. You have to ask yourself, well, what does it mean? It draws attention to the importance of memory. Why are we saying it this way? What can we glean from saying it in a different form? Rememory here has to do with, quote, recollecting and remembering, as in re reassembling the members of the body, the family, the population of the past. And it was the struggle, the pitched battle, she says, between remembering and forgetting that became the device of the narrative. It always has to be remembered, Morrison says, that we're living in a thoroughly racialized society. And I would add that one of the devices of race thinking is forgetting, erasing, leaving out details, facts, figures, contributions, actions, motivations, and people. Memory is power. Documentation is power. Morrison posits history versus memory and memory versus memorylessness. Rememory as in recollecting and remembering as in reassembling the members, by which I think she means, you know, populating the past, the way that we populate empty cells in an Excel sheet, that we're presented with a kind of puzzle of blankness, that we then have to do the work of recovering the missing artifacts and stories. In the essays I've referenced, Morrison is speaking of her own work, but her words speak to our larger project of historiography when she refers to this struggle of the pitched battle between remembering and forgetting. Why is it fraught? Why is it a brawl? because we're living in a society in which the conquerors write the narrative of all of our lives. And so part of the work is that resistance to that story and making a story in which we belong. The concept of rememory says that the, the artifact, the story, the film, the painting, the life is still there. It was never lost. It was never 
forgotten by everyone. It simply wasn't in the official story. And so we need to go back and get it. Rememory is about recovering that which has been left out. And in this way, we revise, expand, and rewrite what we know about our stories with cinema. One of my goals in this talk is to reintroduce French Black American Josephine Baker in terms of her monumental significance as a pioneer of African American cinema. One of the first Black women to star in a feature film, Baker's story offers a portal to a more inclusive and diverse American film history. Yet unfortunately, Baker tends to be known only in bits and pieces through references to her multicultural adopted family, her funny and exoticizing banana dance, her glamorous expatriate life in Paris, or her heroism as a member of the French resistance during World War II. But it's Baker's screen work that exemplifies what Morrison calls a rememory, a remembered memory, one that needs to be returned to the official narrative. My work on Baker is part of a larger collective work that involves many scholars and archivists and artists within Black cinema who are assembling, gathering, and recovering the scraps of memory, as we will we'll all remember that line from Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust. Um, I'll dwell just a little bit on that film because it's a film that perform some of the work that I think is so important to rethinking and being reintroduced to Josephine Baker. In the film, they're leaving, the, fam the Pizat family is leaving Ebo Landing, and the film explores the intergenerational tensions where the central question is something like, what is the baggage weighing us down, and what is heirloom that connects us to our heritage and gives us grounding? What do we need for this new world that we're entering into, and what should we leave behind? This is also a question about cultural retention. Nana's daughters-in-law and grandchildren tease her for the old stories, rituals, and roots that she's always insisting on. Hagar Pizant, played by the late K.C. Moore, says, where we're going, there'll be no need for charms, coins, roots, and flowers. Nana's grandson, Eli Pazant, has lost his faith in what the Africans brought to these shores. But Nana, the family historian, says, we carry these memories inside a we. And Eli, in disbelief and desperation, cries, what are we supposed to remember? But grandmother insists, let the past touch you with the hand of time. Let it feed your head with wisdom, because where you're going is no land of milk and honey. The challenge of freedom is to maintain togetherness and a connection to the past. Nana's words about the unity of uh, also apply to the, the diaspora when she says, we need to be bonded, us what are here and us what are across the sea. We are as two people in one body, here echoing Du Bois, where he writes, one feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder from the souls of Black folk which was published in 1903, around the same time that Daughters of the Dust is set in 1902. So we have these figures just at the beginning of the new century in 1902, 1903, roughly a couple of decades beyond slavery, with Nana still holding the lock of hair that her mother gave her when she was sold away, who are dealing with this question of what do we keep? What do we carry forward into this new age? What do we even have? We have the sense that those Africans who were brought here couldn't have forgotten everything they knew, whatever those recollections might have been, whatever scraps were passed on, she says, let's gather them and remember and rememory them, make their memories our memories and take their memories into our own bodies. Josephine Baker was born Frida Josephine McDonald in St. Louis 
in Missouri in 1906. So just a couple of years beyond um, this moment that I'm describing from Daughters of the Dust and the Souls of Black Folk. She's born into this new century that's just a couple of decades beyond slavery. In her 1927 memoir, she described the city as cold, full of railways, factories, and smoke. St. Louis was a destination for Black migrants in the early years of that wave of migration to cities north and west that I referred to earlier. And eventually, Baker, as a teenager, would join that deliberate flight towards her artistry, her career, and what would become a legendary life in the arts. Josephine Baker was among the first Black women to star in feature films, along with Nina Mae McKinney and Evelyn Preer. She played a leading role in Siren of the Tropics in 1927, Zuzu in 1934, Princess Tam Tam in 1935, and The French Way in 1945. The recent availability of her films from 1920s and 1930s have allowed her work to be seen in the context of recent cinema. In fact, they're seen in a way as recent cinema. Baker's films are for us, I think at once artifacts of a bygone era, as well as renewed artworks that allow audiences to rememory, to ask, well, what is authorship? What does the actor in a film make? How do we assess Baker's role as a star with so few films? Baker challenges the national boundaries of cinema because she was an international entertainer and an African-American performer in French productions, speaking French. Um, when these films do return to the United States, they return as foreign films, but then they're also Black films at the same time. So Baker's story, her film story, really echoes these longstanding discussions of memory and history in African-American humanities. What I'd like to do now, I think, is kind of take take you through her films and some of the information that I know about them. So I would say the most important elements of reintroducing Baker have to do with really emphasizing what her work life in America was like before she goes to Paris. Like we kind of know, if we know anything about Josephine Baker, we know that she was famous in Paris, but she was also well-known and successful in the United States on the Black vaudeville circuit before going to Paris. And in fact, she's invited to Paris because she's so well-known. And she's known for this character called the Comedy End Girl, um, which was um, part of the chorus line, where the chorus line... Um, is more uh, regimented in their movements, kind of kicking their legs up and down. And then there would be Baker on the end of the line um, doing her rubber leg dances, crossing her eyes, um, pretending not to know the very simple movements of the chorus line. She was just kind of creating this other kind of comedic character based on her physicality um, on her own. And so I really look at that aspect of her career as an important memory that's been forgotten. And I would say even Baker didn't value this time herself. Like she would, whenever she referred to her time in the U.S., she would refer to, um, she would describe it as, you know, I was just in the chorus line. I was totally unknown. It was you know, but that's, but actually when I look at it, I see a lot of value there because these are the early years of her career in the 1920s, uh, the early 1920s, when she's performing in Shuffle Along, she's learning her craft and honing her craft uh, and developing the baker that would not only receive the opportunity to go to Paris, but have a foundation that she would build on for the rest of her career 
combining physical comedy with sexuality, with exoticism. Now in Paris, it becomes exotic, right? There she's performing as the only one, the only Black performer on the stage in the shows after the Revue Negra. In the United States, Baker's performance is seen in the context of other Black performers. She's performing in all Black casts. And she's received by the African-American press as a genius, the lightning of jazz, um, and a comedy auteur. And it's when she goes to Paris that then these movements become reframed in terms of the fascination, rediscovery, um, and of course the power differential within colonialism as she's the only black woman on stage, um, often the only dancing figure on stage as well. And that does create a very, um, a very changed context in which she is, has to negotiate her authorship. It's sort of a double edge. On the one hand, she's famous almost instantaneously. Um, in 1925, when she takes the stage in uh, Laura Vue Negra. But after that, um, she then, I think, has to really negotiate what her fame is going to mean to her and what kinds of roles she wants to play. And this all comes to a head when she takes her first film role in Siren of the Tropics in 1927. Siren of the Tropics was directed by Henri Etivien, who was a well-known French actor and film director. Her co-star was Pierre Bachef, who was at his own height uh, in his career as one of France's young leading men. And the screenwriting credit goes to the novelist Maurice de Cobra, who was well-known for his travelogues. Now, what's important about this is that Baker takes on her role in this film as a star among stars. Now, when we look at the films, I think we're looking at the films because she's in them. It's she's she's really the maker of the the 2021 Siren of the Tropics. But in 1927, she takes the risk of entering into movies. She's already established on the stage as a bona fide performer and a star, but she takes the risk of moving into the new medium um, be, with her peers, you know, with people who are who are on her level. It was filmed in brand new studios, the best equipped studios in Paris that were just opened um, in that earlier that year, 1926-27. Um, it was it's set in the tropics, but of course not filmed there. The location shoots included Epinay for the tropical village. Um, they filmed in the Fontainebleau forest for scenes that were supposed to represent the tropical environment. And, um, and then, of course, there are scenes in Paris. The, the trajectory of the film takes Baker's character, Papito, from the tropical environment um, to Paris. And it's remarkable as well that the film debuts at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées, where Baker had debuted a couple of years earlier. Um, in 1925's uh, La Revue Negra. So she, it brought her, in a sense, full circle. And that's what really frustrated her about these, about her performance. Um, she wanted to do something different and explore other aspects of her performance. And she, in her memoirs um, that she published just after the, the film came out, she talks about her disappointment that she's only doing the same thing that um, that she'd been doing on stage, and she didn't really like her character uh, very much. I think that this type of disappointment is so important to remember because um, we're so used to those narratives of triumph with uh, with black actors in film, and that success always feels like success. 
But in Baker's case, her disappointment is a mark of her discernment. This is how we know that Baker was a reader of her own work. She was a spectator to the spectacles that she created. And so she's um, a reliable kind of narrator in a sense. There's, there's a lot of mediation that goes on, of course, but she is a credible and authoritative um, critic of her own work and her own, um, her own productivity. Um, the films, both this film in particular, Siren of the Tropic, the silent film, and to a lesser extent, the sound films that come later, Zuzu and Princess Tam Tam, um, it circulates between these three bodies of cinema. Um, the golden age of French cinema, the golden age of Hollywood cinema, and then the... Um, the, the independent black film movement that's happening at the same time. She kind of speaks to the ambivalence of the black presence, I think, across these bodies of films. Um, in When Siren of the Tropics comes to the United States, and before it comes to the United States, I should say, it was um, hotly anticipated and um, and, and heavily promoted because Baker was a known entity. I mean, this is someone who, um, whose complexion was the name of a particular kind of stocking that you could buy. Um, there was a makeup, a kind of foundation that also had her name, her hairstyle, um, her face was everywhere. She, I mean, she was, uh, she was a real commodity and a real star, a I suppose you'd say a bankable commodity. And so the idea that then this girl from St. Louis who makes good in France is now going to come back to the United States as a film star really opens up some exciting possibilities for, um, for entering into Hollywood, having more black actors in Hollywood and more glamor in, in, in these black performances. Um, however, uh, when the films actually do arrive, the critics are really disappointed with the film. The critics of the Chicago Defender, the Amsterdam News, Baltimore Afro-American, they all had really rich reviews of the film in which they parsed her performance, its possibilities for American film in general and for black film in particular, but they were especially critical of the racial narrative of Siren of the Tropics. It's a really important critique so that, you know, Baker is supposed to be at least offstage. She's an object of desire, but in the film, she's a desiring object um, rather than a desiring subject so that she's, she, you know, becomes enamored of one of the other characters this engineer ends up on the island where she is, ba 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 there's some rescuing and saving of each other's lives. And what the reviewer says is he's not really making an effort, and yet she's willing to kind of throw her entire life away to follow this person. And so they kind of build on that to say there's no real investment in Baker's character. There's no real sense of her being the star. And this pattern of Baker being in the B narrative of her own film um, does play out again and again in Zuzu and then in Princess Tam Tam. In the last feature film, The French Way, um, it's a it's a little bit different in that she plays a cabaret owner, but here she's a mechanism for other people getting together. She's she plays kind of something similar to the nurse character in Romeo and Juliet um, for these two young people in the film who want to be together despite their feuding families. Um, so the question of Baker's stardom on screen and on stage and how she's negotiated is a very important part of what needs to be remembered about her and that what we remember is contingent and not necessarily happy, but it's, but it's essential to getting a fuller understanding of what her career meant.
One of the things that I I definitely want to bring people's um, attention to is her vibrant posters, uh, the posters for her films. These um, posters in themselves hold some of the story for thinking about Josephine Baker and thinking about her as um, as a rememory of black film. One, they recall her stage performances. They give us that sense of a prismatic image that contains both the stage Josephine Baker of the past, the character that she's playing in the film, and then her overall kind of entertainment persona. A number of the posters reference her famous banana dance, uh, which she performed at the Folie Bergère in 1926. And through that reference, they kind of have this overall sense of the exotic, the tropical, the different, the other, really played up with bright colors and giving a sense that that's where her stardom lies. Uh, It's a renaming of her pre-existing persona. One of the challenging aspects of thinking about Josephine Baker is that you're always kind of navigating her prism of the character, what's off screen, what's on screen, because anything that's on screen is also off screen. And then within her character, she's uh, portraying a figure that is a thin veil of Baker's own star persona. There is an aspect of a kind of girl woman. There is an aspect of the exotic, but placed into the narrative of film, there's also this aspect of the wanted, unwanted. So when we look at Baker's films today, we're looking at um, we're looking at Baker as herself a work of art that is well-crafted, that is uh, intentional, that is clear in the aesthetic that's then placed within um, a really specific genre of the musical comedy of a French film that circulates with Black independent films and Hollywood films and takes on a variety of complex meanings. So as Elizabeth Ezra pointed out, Baker was geographically impossible to locate. She was so popular because she was hard to place, a floating signifier of cultural difference. She represented many things to many different people. She could evoke Africa, she could evoke the Caribbean, as well as the United States and France, depending on what the film required. In Princess Tam Tam, she is a Tunisian shepherdess. In Zuzu, she is a laundress of uncertain tropical origins. And then, of course, in Siren of the Tropics, she's meant to be um, a Caribbean um, girl, girlish uh, figure. So location is an important aspect of Baker's story, both in the film stories that she performed in, and that's what makes her story. Hers is one of moving between locations from St. Louis to New York, from New York to Paris, and then from Paris back again as a cinematic figure, and then of course around the world as as a performer. But I just wanted to point out the significance of recording this lecture in Miami Beach, the traditional homelands of the Seminole, as well as the historical groups of the Calusa and the Tocobega. Uh, today, the state of Florida is, the, is home to the Seminole, Miccosukee, Muscogee, and the Choctaw, and individuals of many other Native groups. Um, this type of knowledge helps us to begin to interrogate our relationships to land, to history, Um, and to our present, and especially the social relationships that shape those places. Um, Josephine Baker's story is part of that process, and that Baker uh, performed here on Miami Beach in 1951 at the Copa City Hotel. Folks may or may not know that Miami Beach was a sundown town. African Americans could not be on the beach after 6 o'clock unless they had a specific work permit. Uh, Miami Beach was constructing itself as a space of leisure, 
um, glamorous, sophisticated nighttime leisure through the nightclub, but also important aspects of American identity were being worked out in the nightclub and the racial uh, stratifications that on the mainland and during the day. Um, were also maintained at night at the club. So when Baker comes to Miami Beach to perform, she was performing in Havana and was seen there. She's known as a bankable commodity. She's known less as a film star, as I said before, but more as a global entertainer of significance. And the owners of the Copa City booked her and brought her to Miami Beach, but she refused to perform to segregated audiences and insisted that African-Americans, Jews and Catholics could be part of the audience. This really demonstrates something I think that's really important about the ways that leisure was racialized, but also something about Baker's career and her relationship to race and culture. Early in her career, she is constructing her ambition around just being ambitious, and she uh, takes opportunities. She reinvents herself multiple times. She takes what's given to her in terms of this, you know, in Paris, this exotic persona, and she makes it her own and ends up building a very long career around it. Um, that changes over time when she's just 19 years old when she arrives in Paris and um, and she was in her uh, in her 60s when she when she died in 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 the early 1970s and still uh, and still performing. All of this um, really, I think, encourages us to rememory her put her story back into film history, despite the fact that there are these few films, because the significance of this enormous live performer taking on the film medium in her own way, navigating through her characters, um, ending up in this strange kind of B-roll, and yet ending up being the very reason that the films are preserved, seen, written about, and thought about, so that, you know, 50 years later, we're still talking about Josephine Baker. Josephine Baker is a chance to rethink our um, well-worn categories of national cinema, French cinemas like this, British cinema, American cinema, and to really pay attention to these moments where, um, where those national boundaries break down. Josephine Baker was a Black American performer in white productions, French productions, colonialist productions, um, and yet she was a pioneer of African-American cinema. Her films circulated in the United States with race films, um, with the early, um, the, uh, the early Hollywood films. Uh, when By the time her silent film comes to the U.S., it's, it is a little outdated, um, but it's still moving with Hallelujah, um, King Vidor's Hallelujah, which stars Nina Mae McKinney. It's still part of the overall idea of thinking through the Black presence on film and imagining um, what that can be. So is Josephine Baker a rememory of a global film history? Absolutely. And it's really the, the scholarship and our thinking about what constitutes film history that needs to change and expand in order to think through the important and um, nearly forgotten dimensions of this crucial film star.